Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, your favorite niche real estate website, thelandgeek.com. And this week's Roundtable podcast, it's just me. Team is off. But that being said, I have an amazing guest. It's his second time on the podcast. You probably already know. And don't judge him from the South African accent. It's MC Laubscher from CashflowNinja.com. If you're not familiar with MC, he's a husband, a dad, a podcaster, author, and most importantly to you, dear listener, a cash flow expert. So as a cash flow investor and entrepreneur, MC's passion is to assist investors and business owners to create, recover, warehouse, and multiply cash flow through advanced strategies. Oh, by the way, I've been on his podcast, the Cashflow Ninja podcast. And he also had a couple other people that were kind of cool besides me, Robert Kiyosaki and Greg Cardone, you know, a few others, but mainly me. And his podcast has been downloaded four and a half million times in over 180 countries and has been featured as one of the top 48 podcasts to entrepreneurs by Entrepreneur Magazine and is regularly featured as one of the top 100 podcasts by Apple Podcasts. MC also founded Producers Wealth insurance brokers helping clients in the United States with advanced cash flow strategies and producers, capital partners, a firm assisting investors all over the world to invest in alternative assets that produce, my favorite word, passive income in an any economy and market. MC, welcome back. Great to see you. It's great to see you. So what have you been up to since we last spoke? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been quite a journey, right? Uh, it's it's incredible how time flies when you're having fun. You know, five six years already of of just you know knowing each other and following your work. So congratulations on all the things that that are happening in your world. It's just been incredible to to watch your journey. Um, yeah, on my end, um, you know, Cashflow Ninja, which started just as a podcast, has grown into a full blown financial education company. So we do uh, you know we've published over nine hundred shows. Um, we've got resources, programs, and then also uh, now books, just sharing, you know, cash flow investing as a strategy, which is kind of, you know, in our world, it's comical to say that we have to still like, you know, preach, you know, the cash flow investing strategy, because a lot of folks that, that have come into our world have started to realize um, how powerful it is to have full control over your wealth strategy. Uh, and within your wealth strategy, especially if it delivers passive income. Um, but there's still a lot of other folks that are still trapped in, uh, I would say, the, you know, the, the Wall Street model, the casino model. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So we continue to preach that. Um, I've been involved in a lot of fun projects. I've got to say, and of course, you meet a lot of incredible people along the way. Um, obviously, uh, Cash flow investing is is kind of at the core of everything that I do, but uh, I have to say, you know, besides the first light bulb in my life being cash flow, you know, 21 years ago, when I read Robert Kiyosaki's book Rich Dad Poor Dad, bought my first investment property, and um, after I collected rent and paid all of my bills, I had money left over, cash flow, and I was like, how many times can I do this? This is incredible. How many of these units can I have, uh, or, and or own? Um, that was a light bulb moment, the cash flow. Then becoming my own banker was, a, was an, a second light bulb moment, which is just cash flow management and being more efficient and effective with your cash flow management because it sort of amplifies what you're doing in your personal business and investing economy. Um, the third light bulb, uh, you know, and, and it was there, always there, but it's become really, really to the forefront was, you know, just this of partnering with incredible cash flow uh, ninjas, as I call them, uh, working with great operators, because it's a very, very great way of uh, just diversifying cash flow streams too, right? So I've sure. always, you know, I learned that when I, when I realized that in certain niches, you pick your cash flow niche, you pick your market, there's a dominant player in it, maybe one or two, and usually it's one very dominant player. Um, and that dominant player is the, 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 the cash flow ninja. Um, nothing happens in that market or that niche without that person knowing about it. <laughs> and if something's about to happen, they'll know about it first because people will tell them. So to compete with them is really, I mean, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's tough. So 
The next step then becomes how do you partner with them? Um, and what can you bring to the table with them? Um, and obviously there's a ton of different ways in which you can bring different types of capital to, to partner with them. Um, but it's been great. It's been great to, to then diversify cash flow uh, income streams. Cause I just feel like today too, especially in the economy that we're living in, you know, this pretty exciting times. I see, I think it's very exciting. I've got the, uh, you know, I, I see a lot of doom and gloom out there, but I find it extremely exciting because of the opportunities. But you have to be a little bit smarter, too. It's just, you know, in diversified income streams and in different niches and different markets from different assets is a good way to position yourself really well in an environment that's unfolding, which we don't really have a crystal ball of how it all plays out. No, uh, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's so interesting because, you know, obviously you're preaching to the choir with mm-hmm. me and most likely the listeners, but and we're talking about passive income. We're talking about cash flow. I got a, a an email yesterday and like, okay, you know, here's, here's a fund and here's for appreciation and here's for yield and cash flow. Like, you know, they, you know, real estate and alternative investments and then appreciation. And I'm looking at the appreciation stuff. I'm thinking, well, why do people invest for appreciation and why, or is it, Something we should like. I never think about appreciation. I just want cash flow. How do you think about it? You know, um, it comes down to almost like a. I call it the four dimensional wealth strategy. If I have to break it down, so there's a lot of folks that follow the the Wall Street mo- model and the Wall Street casino model is essentially a one dimensional strategy, and that is, I'm going to buy some Apple stock, and I'm hoping <laughs> that Apple stock's going to go up. Markets go up, down, and sideways. So you're betting it on like that 33.33333333 um, uh, bet that, that it's going to go your right way. And then essentially, you're going to either sell it or you're going to feel really good about yourself seeing that, that, your, that your account value has gone up. But that's essentially it. And it's very one-dimensional. It's essentially just for profit or just for appreciation. You know? right. and, and, and that's it. <laughs> so, right. So, so, yeah, so you're either going to pay for appreciation or you're going to real appreciation when you sell, you pay tax. And then what do you do? Exactly. Do it, do it again? That, I don't that, know. It's risky. <laughs> exactly. Very one dimensional. So, what, how I look at it too, um, and, and, and here's, you know, before I get to the four dimensional uh, wealth strategy, as I call it, the thing is, you have to be clear on your strategy what you're looking to do, and then you build it out, right? So, you know, if I'm going to, um, let's just say I'm going to install, you know, a light fixture, which I'm probably not, I'm not very handy. I'm probably going to pay someone to do that, but let's just pretend that I'm going to do that. I'm going to have a toolbox with different tools in that. And there's different tools that I'm going to use for different, to do different things to eventually install that light, light fi- fixture. So I look at the a wealth strategy as the same thing. So how the how the, the the ultra wealthy look at it is that I mean there's different things that do different things for them within their overall wealth strategy. That's why you have different types of income. You know that's why even folks that are just kicking butt and and, and taking names uh, such as yourself in the land business, there's other ancillary incomes from that one income stream. Whether it be podcasting, whether it be coaching, whether it be that kind of stuff, because there's different there's different reasons why you have it in your overall strategy. So you have to be clear of what your strategy is, what you're looking to accomplish, and then you 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 figure out. All right, I need some tools to accomplish this. So this is where the four dimensional kind of wealth strategy comes in. The first thing is cash flow, right? Because cash flow is king, not cash. Right, right. <laughs> cash flow. Cash flow is a cash flow investor, and that's what we're passionate about because we want to own things that pays us. Why would you want to own something if it doesn't pay you? You know, so have something that pays you and produces cash flow. Um, and also, as a cash flow investor, I mean, you're, you're, you're benefiting then from all the tax benefits, earning that income stream. And that's kind of the second part of it is the first dimension is cash flow. Is it paying me? Is it paying me to hold it and to own it? The second part of it is, well, 
What is it doing it for me from a tax perspective? How effective and efficient is that income? Is it reducing any of my taxes? Is it like the one dimensional strategy of the appreciation play? Am I just going to get hammered every time that I make money? Because that's not a lot of fun on taxes, right? Right. So is it actually efficient income from a tax perspective? And, and is it an asset that could essentially reduce my taxes? Um and then I would say, even on, on the third part, yeah, that's appreciation, but it's sort of a bonus. And what I like about appreciation plays is forced appreciation plays. Um, and, can, and can, can you define forced appreciation? It comes to controlling the, and managing the asset to improve operations and performance of that as, asset. And as a result, the business is more valuable uh, the value of the business is higher, and now you're forcing the appreciation of that asset. Um, instead of buying Apple stock and hoping uh, <laughs> that Tim Cook or whatever idiot's running it at that stage knows what they're doing, how how can I how can I control and manage my own asset, force appreciation through the operations and efficiency in my business where I have more control over it? So that's the appreciation when I talk about that dimension. It's not quite the same as buying, you know, hoping that you, your, your timing is correct. And then on the fourth, the fourth side of it, too, is, yeah, it's great cash flow. Yes, it's great if it can reduce taxes. Yes, it's great if it can appreciate in value over, over time and you can exit it if you want to. But on the other thing is you said something really powerful about passive income. Passive which by definition means that you're not doing too much <laughs> to get right. that income. So how can you accomplish that? Leveraging the skill set, the capabilities, and the unique ability and the capital of others. So that's where great operators come, come in. You know, if you pick, let's just pick real estate for a second, you know, and even like multifamily. Now you have a great operator that is the cash flow ninja in a specific market. They know everything that they need to do from a, to, to, uh, to increase the value of the operations, to generate more cash flow. You're getting the tax benefits. And then eventually, I mean, you're leveraging their skill sets, their knowledge, their capabilities, their network, their community, the capital that they can bring in as an investor to invest uh, passively in that. So that's kind of how I look at it. I look at it for, uh, four-dimensional. And, and just to bring it back to the wealth strategy, so when you're investing in something, it's like, what is it? What is it supposed to do? And what is it going to do for me? Sometimes you're going to need things that are, are very cash flow heavy. I love those. Sometimes you might need something for taxes. Um, sometimes you might need something from, a lever from an extra leverage standpoint, um, and which is eventually results it brings in for the appreciation play. You know, and then there's a lot of investments or, or vehicles and strategies that produce all four of those. Um, but it all depends on your strategy, what, what, what you're looking to do. Yeah, no, I, I love the way that you laid that out and the, uh, the, the four um, pillars, if you will. <laughs> yeah. I, I forgot what was the term you, what you, you Oh, dimensions. The four dimensions. I see, it's I, like I checkers in, versus chess. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I'm I'm such a concrete thinker. I can't think of dimensions. I have to think of pillars. <laughs> I can put my hands around it. But Those it's, Roman it's, columns, the pillars. It, it's a really great way of getting people uh, to think about it in in a a more intelligent way as it comes to their wealth strategy, which all ultimately comes down to, but well, why get wealthy in the first place? Why right. even do this? And I know I have my answer. Ultimately, for you, when you think about, well, why am I seeking out these cash flow ninjas? Why am I trying to be tax efficient? Why am I looking for forced appreciation? You know, why am I doing all these things? And ultimately, what would be the empty Laubscher answer? What what is your your why for that? You know, I think at the core is you know, freedom. And that is a very broad term these, these days. Have they changed the definition on that word yet? I, I don't think they have. I, <laughs> I, I think freedom might be defined as 
doing what you want to do, when you want to do it, where you want to do it. With who you want to do it. Yeah. And I mean, and that's how I, that's how I look at it. My definition of freedom is essentially spending, you know, my time, the way that I want to spend my time, not doing things or making decisions based on, um, based on money, essentially. Money is not a reason why I, I'm doing something and or not doing something. And then I would also say the freedom of relationships, you know, doing things with the people that I love to do stuff with. Um, and then the, the fourth part of that, I, I would say, you know, is, is, is your purpose to work inside of your purpose. Um, and, you know, I've been part of strategic coach. Dan Sullivan talks about that all the time, those four freedoms. And I, I, I love adding the, the location part of it too. That's changed right. a lot over the last three years, but that's another big one too, of going where you want to go um, with the people that you want to go with and do things with, not having money be a reason or not, and spending, uh, spending your time in, 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 in the ways that you wish to sp- spend your time with. And the other thing that, you know, I think it's a, I think at the core of that too, for me, is I love that definition, Dan Sullivan's kind of, you know, um, uh, uh, vision of, of, of what freedom is. I love the, the concept too of, of sovereign and sovereignty and being a sovereign individual. And that actually is, a. have been spending a lot of time thinking about that too. Oh, of no. exactly are we, are we that- going down the crypto rabbit hole now, MC? No, no, <laughs> no. Um, what, what, and, and how I think of it is from a sovereign standpoint, right? Is if you think of things changing, how much control do you have? Um, and how can you survive outside or independent of what's happening to systems and processes around you if they're collapsing or resetting? Um, and sometimes when you hear that, you know, especially folks in the U S it's like, all right, I, I hear you. I hear you. But I I'm originally from South Africa, as you mentioned, not a Pennsylvanian accent. So I've actually seen, I've actually seen what sovereignty means, um, and what it is to be a sovereign individual or have a sovereign uh, family inside of systems that are not really there that you take for granted. Right. So a lot of people, I'll give an example. So a lot of people here in the West take for granted that they're inside of their, 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 their houses, which has electricity. Fancy that. Right. People don't in South Africa take that for granted in most part, you know, of the country and most parts of Africa too. They don't necessarily just take that for granted. So what can you do? You know, like if, if there's, and, and, this, you know, I know this is with an African kind of lens and people might be thinking, oh, this could never happen here. It's already happening in California, by the way. Oh, um, sure. and, it's prob- and it's probably going to happen all across Europe. So from an electricity standpoint, most people in South Africa, just they're, they're energy independent in the sense that they have solar. You know, they have solar panels, they have generators. My folks uh, go, you know, at this time of recording about eight hours a day without electricity. Uh, there was one day that was around 22 hours. Um, they didn't miss a beat. They didn't skip the no. beat because, uh, be, yeah, because they just prepared for it. They're, they're, they're sovereign from an electricity standpoint. They're of their own water source, which is then powered by that source. You know, so you look at, you think of these systems that we, where we live, just, it, it just, you don't even think about it. It's just assumed um, and then you kind of rely to other systems that are, you know, and, and processes around you and you kind of build that out. And eventually when that comes down to is there's ways that you can, there's ways that you can structure your, your, your life for yourself, your family, uh, your community, your businesses uh, and your uh, uh, investments that puts you in a much stronger position from this sovereign kind of perspective and being you know, self-sufficient, if you will. Um, and you don't have to get crazy preparation on it. It's just common, just basic building blocks of planning. All right, here's what's going on right now. If this happens, then this is in place. If this happens, then this is in place. And when I, when I, when I shared this in early 2020, people thought, man, this guy's in like a nutcase. And then all of a sudden, you know, the supply chain issue started happening. And there were folks in our network that thought about this that rented empty warehouses, spaces, stocked up products. They're crushing it right now. 
just yeah, because I started thinking a little bit of how dependent am I on all these things, you know, the, these networks that have been built out, what can I do to uh, manage risk, uh, you know, from, from that perspective. So I think that's a big part of it too. And I wanted to bring that in because it's tough to have the freedom conversation without that kind of stuff. Cause you could be like, Oh, well, I've got all, you know, all the cash flow and, you know, freedom of all these kind of things, but I'm sitting in the dark and I don't have a candle to, to, to light. That's also, it, that does, doesn't sound like a lot of fun to me. And that doesn't sound too freedom ish for me, if that makes sense. No, and it's so true. And it's even hit home for me. I've, I've got a very good friend in Sumba in Indonesia, yep. uh, surfing, teaching yoga. And at nine o'clock, there's no more power. Bedtime. Yep. Like you don't have a choice. Um, it's that, that's where they stay. That's a small island. They're not, they could have all the wealth. Doesn't matter. Um, powers out at nine and you're just going to bed whether you want to or not. So it's, it's the really, you know, uh, interesting way to, see, to look at it. There's a great book out there. I think it's from the 99 called the sovereign individual that really talks a lot about this yep. in, in different arenas of your life. And I think it's something that I know I don't think about enough. And I think it's a great reminder, especially as we're living in such times of so much uncertainty, so much change that we, I mean, I know for me, I didn't grow up uh, with this idea like of, of being sovereign. It's sort of, a, especially in the West, it's a, it's a new thing. I mean, just think financially. You've got yeah. custodians over your money. Right. And uh, Scott Todd and I were, were kind of complaining today. We're waiting, like our bank is holding a wire, a significant amount of money going through some kind of political stuff with this wire and like, this shouldn't be. <laughs> and they're like, well, this is why people like crypto so much because you want yeah. to get rid of the middleman, uh, which is why I kind of haze you. So oh, we're going down the crypto rabbit hole. But I, I think it was, it was a really good point. So um, which leads me to my, my next question. So how are you personally thinking about or what ways are you personally taking full responsibility within your life to give you more sovereign today than you were, say, a year or two ago? You know, I, I think that um, over the course of, I would say, the past five years, I started to start to think about a lot of stuff that I was seeing. You know, I, I, and I still have family and friends in South Africa. So I go back and visit there and I'm like, oh, wow, this is kind of this is kind of the reality there. And it's still a great place. Love to visit and, and so forth. But when you live there, there's just things that people just take for like. They, they just have to adapt. And that's, by the way, if you want to have adaptive people in the world, you know, you go to like Africa, you go to Latin America, you go to, you know, Southeast Asia, those countries, those people know how to adapt. They know, you know, I, I could see a lot of folks freaking out over like the electricity part of it. Right. But mo these folks, they just, you know, it's just part of their life. They, they, they deal with it. You know, in the area to, to just, finish that point in the area that I grew up in Estelmosh, there's a lot of amazing vineyards there and they grow, um, they grow a lot of uh, Sauvignon Blanc and Chenin Blanc uh, there with obviously Cabernet and Pinotage varietals, but the white wine varietals too, when you harvest those, they have to go in big tanks uh, and they have to be at a certain temperature. So, you know, the, 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 the farmers there, they're not going to cry when the electricity goes out. They're going to make sure that they've got backups and generators so that they don't lose, you know, gallons and gallons and gallons of, you know, the Sauvignon Blanc and the, the Chenin Blanc varietals, which they just harvested. So you just the first year probably it happened. It stung. It hurt. You had to dump a lot of stuff, but you won't get caught again. So I looked at some of the things that were that were happening you know, that I saw in, in Africa and some of the things that I started to see a little bit in, in the West. And I'm like, well, what are some of the things that I can put in place for my family, um, for myself, my family, for the community that I'm, that I'm in, and then for my business and then and, and, and some of my investments. So what, what are they, you know, obviously, you know, we talked about electricity, we talked about water, we talked about food. And by the way, that, that there's such a big movement right now around food. And 
just not in, in, in just in the United States, but globally. I think a lot of people have started to realize too, we've been so prosperous and the systems have been so um, effective and efficient for the past 20 years that all of a sudden over the past three years, everybody's like, wait a second, there isn't certain things in my grocery store anymore. And if they are, they're very expensive. How about that? So, you know, being closer to food sources and understanding where food com comes from. You know, if you're living in certain areas, you can develop relationship with farmers and co-ops and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, and, and, and then also protection is huge. In, uh, in, to use the, uh, the, the South African example again, and in Africa, and most folks in Africa, and again, Latin America and Southeast Asia knows this, that um, you're responsible for your own safety. <laughs> you know, that's right. You are, you own that, you own your, you're accountable and you're responsible for that. Um, there isn't, you're not going to pick up a phone and just call someone. And then someone's at the front, at your front doorstep five minutes later or five seconds later, or how quickly to come and help. So you're going to have to figure out how to defend and protect, you know, your home and, and your family until help comes. Now, in other parts of the world, like I said, especially in, in Africa and so forth, most folks are like, yeah, that's kind of like, one-on-one stuff <laughs> but right, here in the right. west everybody's like i'll just call the police what if you can't call the police and right. folks think that is extreme da, 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 that kind of stuff you know if you look at certain trends in place you want to be in a situation to protect yourself and and, and your family you don't want to rely just on, on, on again, other systems and, and, and structures to, to have those things in place. And then for your business, for your businesses too, do a risk analysis of stuff. See things that are starting to happen in your business and in your niche dangers, which you should be aware of. Once you identify those, you, you'll probably see a ton of opportunities. I use the example of one guy in our network that started to see, man, the supply chains are like, out of control. There's such a shortage of stuff in his industry and he's in packaging. So what did he do? Well, there was a lot of people over the past three years weren't going into work. So there was a lot of empty warehouses, a lot of empty offices, that kind of stuff. He understands this. So he negotiated a very, very good lease, a month to month lease, and then stocked up um, on, on, on products and stuff that he knew was going to be in, in short supply during busy, busy times. And obviously, he's going to be able to charge a premium for it. So right. that's one way from a business standpoint. Every business is different. If you have physical products, if you have digital products, um, you know, there's different risk factors involved. And then from your investments, too, look at some of the things, the dangers out there. there by the way, if you identify the dangers in certain in the investment world, there are so, here's the thing about change, right? You said uncertainty, change, massive disruption, change faster than we've seen before, which leads to chaos, usually societally, because, you know, the kind of the economics boil to the top, to the top. people don't know what's going on. Yeah. Um, they just see that they lose their job, the value of the money is going down, all that kind of stuff. So it manifests the, the craziness. But as an investor, you look at this and go, wow, there's a bottleneck here. There's a bottleneck there. There's distortions over here. So um, protect what you have, have a strategy, a, a, a good wealth strategy, but then also leave some room to capitalize on some opportunities. There's a couple of, of, of areas right now where folks, you know, I'll, I'll give you two. Um, obviously, commodities, land, commodities, land. and so forth, are it's just in gangbusters right now. There's bottlenecks in a, in a lot of these commodity markets. One of the big, big bottlenecks is in the energy market. Yeah, I just Huge had a precious energy metals market. guy uh, on and, you know, lithium batteries. Oh, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. So there's so many ways to play the energy. You could go the, the, the infrastructure, really, that the world has in place, which is reliant on the fossil fuel stove, you know, so whether it's oil, natural gas, um, whether it is nuclear or coal, there's an infrastructure and there's a huge push to go to, you know, solar and wind and hydroelectric and hydrogen and all this stuff. There's no infrastructure in place yet for that. So when you switch the one, the one system off and there's no infrastructure built out, which could take 5, 10, 15 years to build this out, you have a massive imbalance 
which now folks are capitalizing on because you still have the same demand for energy across the world. <laughs> so if you reduce the supply, the demand stays the same. There's a massive imbalance that folks can capitalize on. The other way to play it, and this is Jim Rogers, one of his biggest positions is copper, you know, on the EV side of it, you know, right. Uh, incredible opportunity there. So a lot of folks, instead of buying like Tesla shares, hoping that goes up, all these folks are going to get into the EV market. You know, all of these, there's many different companies and um, all the big guys will do that. So instead of trying to pick a winner, how do you participate in this? Well, there's copper, there's lithium, there's rare earth metals, there's which aren't really rare. I've learned that too. Fun fact. But they're there and they're needed for batteries. So you can position yourself there. Um, how about food? Same thing. Massive supply destruction. Same demand. You know, people aren't going to eat less. The sizes of Domino's pizza aren't going to get smaller to accommodate for it. It still needs to stay the same size. So right. there's a massive opportunity for folks to, to position themselves in there, too. I mean, there's so many of these right now. Right. So, um, yeah. So things that I'm personally doing to be more a sovereign is start with myself, you know, mindset, uh, being physically, mentally and spiritually strong, control what goes into your house. Everybody wants to change the world. Let's change your house first inside, inside your own walls. Um, make sure that that, that that is a strong unit. Then you can contribute and do the same in your community. Uh, and then look at risk factors for your business and then for your, for your investments. And look at all the opportunities. You know, I love that book that you mentioned, The Sovereign Individual. There's a couple of those talking about all these you know, massive disruptions that would come. I'm just so happy to be alive to see the, all of the many that's coming, whether it's the internet of things, the people of the internet of things, 5G, 3D printing, artificial intelligence. Uh, I mean, you could go on and on and on, all these things that are being rolled out pretty quickly right now. So um, yeah, I'm pretty excited to live through you know, all these changes. Um, yeah, I mean, and Peter Diamandis and Stephen Kyle wrote this great book called Bold, talking yeah. about these these uh, these new technologies emerging, and now they're they're getting closer and closer. It's 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 an amazing time to be alive. Yeah, and and again, there's going to be folks that don't see anything coming, and obviously, I'm preaching to the choir with with your listeners and, and yourself. But there's going to be folks. You just have to understand as an investor to the environment that you're operating in. Um, that there's going to be a lot of folks that don't see any of this coming. They don't listen to podcasts such as these, which they should, uh, to kind of understand what is happening, what is in the process of happening. Um, the folks that do see all these things coming and position themselves, I mean, they're going to be on, on the right side of this greatest wealth transfer, which I've heard, you know, probably for the past 30 years, everybody talks about this great wealth transfer. I mean, we've seen the wealth transfer, you know, since 2020 really it went into overdrive. We've seen right. it sort of slowly over the past 20 years, but 2020 was like, it was, uh, it was, it was incredible. Um, and they're going to continue to be on the right side of this, knowing what's coming, knowing what, what is happening because it's going to manifest itself in many different ways, which would sort of be a distraction from the underlying, um, you know, the underlying cause. Absolutely. Well, MC, it's always a pleasure talking to you and your mentorship has been phenomenal this podcast, but now we're at that point where I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you for your tip of the week, a website, a resource, another book, something else actionable for the art of passive income listeners to go improve their businesses, improve their lives. What have you got? There's something that I've been thinking about quite a bit, and it actually, it's actually the it's actually the ninja part of the cash flow ninja. So my dad is a very well known martial artist. He used to travel six to eight countries a year, ninth and a black belt. He's 74 years old, could still kick Ooh. my butt, just clobber. Wow. Me. Um, and the lesson that I've learned from him was that he pursues excellence in his craft daily. So it's almost like Nelson Nash always talked about the arrival syndrome where people are like, oh, I've arrived at knowledge. I'm really smart. I'm right there. I arrived at knowledge. It's almost kind of the same concept where, so here's what I will share with listeners. In your capacity as a business owner or as an investor, pursue excellent in your craft as a business owner or an investor. Get better every single day. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's one tip that I'd share that I've really focused on this year is every day. I just want to get better every day. 
I'll never know everything that there is to know. No one does. You know, um, you'll never reach that essentially that 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 uh, summit that everybody thinks that, oh, I'm right there. You look at the most successful investors, the most successful entrepreneurs. They're just trying to get better and learn and um, get better every single day. So that's the one tip that I would I would share Um that I would share with your listeners is just pursue excellence in your craft daily as a business owner and as an investor. Yeah, I love that. And you see it in life where people who are just mediocre feel like, oh, I'm good enough. And then they're like, okay, I'm, I'm good enough at this piece of whatever they're, they're doing. And then you see the people who are above average uh, are like, okay, I'm going to keep working on this, but they don't, really have a, you know, a, a, a real strong path forward on how they do it. They kind of do it, you know, here and there. And then you have the people who, this is my craft and they work on it every single day. And they have a, a internal drive to get better. Or what I like to say is like, I like to be less wrong every day. And so I'm doing, and, they, and just like James Clear talks about in the Atomic Habits, Doing that every single day compounds. And to your point, you'll never get to the top, but you will at some point be able to be like, okay, relative to my peers, I'm excellent at this. Like your dad is excellent at kicking butt in his martial art. And, you know, MC, you are clearly excellent in your craft of investing and disseminating knowledge, podcasting, and just being a phenomenal human being. So thank you so much because my tip of the week was learn more about MC Lobster. Go to cashflowninja.com and find all the MC Lobster goodness there. I also want to remind people that today's podcast is sponsored by Flight School. Learn how the next 16 weeks can transform your life. Go up that mountain of land investing with Scott Todd as your Sherpa quickly, safely, efficiently. Oh yeah, and that flight school tuition ain't gonna cost you nothing. Guaranteed, you're gonna make it back 180 days or less. Just show us your work, schedule a call, go to landgeek.com forward slash training. Landgeek.com forward slash training. MC, are we good? We're we're fantastic. Um Love, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, well, thank you for having me come on your show. Uh, it's been a blast and always love our, our conversations and appreciate you and everything that you do. Thank you so much. I also remind the listeners the only way, the only way we're getting to quality guests like an MC Lobster from cashflowninja.com is if you do us three little favors. Follow, rate, review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of that review to support at the link.com. I'm going to send it to you for free a signed copy of Dirt Rich. So please do it. It does help. All right, let's do this. One, two, three. Let freedom ring. Thanks, everybody. I love it. Thanks for listening to the Art of Passive Income podcast. Are you ready to learn how you can start building a passive income without renters, rehabs, renovations, or rodents? Schedule a free consultation at thelandgeek.com forward slash training. Let freedom ring.